we just want to thank everyone who's joined us today um, through a partnership with iDefine and SETBP1 Society, the KDVS Foundation welcomes you to our second series of webinars called It Takes a Village, which occurs the first Saturday of the month. Um, through this partnership, our wonderful communities will have the chance to share resources and join informative webinars that apply to our populations. Today, we are excited to discuss IEPs with you again, but with the, our older population of students, um, which is a really important topic, I think nearly for all of our families that um, are a part of these different organizations. So I think this will be really valuable. Um, I'm Casey and I'll be your host again on behalf of Cool and Degrees Syndrome Foundation. I am mom to Hudson who uh, just turned 11 on May 25th and he was diagnosed with, diagnosed with KDVS just a few years ago. So we are all up in the IEPs. <laughs> so I'm excited too as a mom just to get all the tips. Um, because we are kind of entering into that different age bracket. So I'm really, really excited. And then I'm going to be sharing the Zoom screen uh, with two IEP experts. So I am super excited to have them here. It's Dan Morial and Molly Iveson, and they're going to teach an educational session focusing on grades fifth through 12. We'll get to know Dan and Molly in just a few minutes, but I do have a couple of things for housekeeping. Um, we do want to thank you for submitting all the questions, and we're going to do our best to answer those. Uh, time permitting, we'll also take questions as we go. So as you're listening, if there's something that's of interest to you or sparks a question in your mind, feel free just to type it in the chat, and we'll try to answer those as well. The call is being recorded, and we will make sure that we share the link on social media and via email after the call. I do want to tell a little bit about the partnership because this is something new for us and it's something we're all really, really excited about. Um, it's, it's what we're calling It Takes a Village is going to be a program full of useful, interesting, and fun events for families and caregivers and ch of children diagnosed with three rare genetic disorders. Program topics will be driven by what the families you all want to hear about. Potential programs include musical therapy, sensory processing, and of course, the individualized education programs that we're hosting today and, and recently hosted for the younger students. These volunteer-based nonprofits are working really, really hard to find answers, expand research, and better understand the impact of rare disorders on the health of the individuals that they advocate for. And by doing this, what we've all learned by being volunteers, it leaves a lot, it leaves very little time uh, and money to do other projects. And so by pooling our resources, we're able to create a shared library of interactive educational content that the organizations can each offer on their respective websites. By partnering with other rare disorder groups, we're able to combine forces and expand the size of the team that's working so hard. So it's really exciting. And I think as someone said it best is that when we all work together to progress, we all win. And so it's just really heartwarming to see these organizations coming together and, and working hard to make sure that we're able to give you all the resources that you need. So now without further ado, let's get to know Dan and Molly. Dan is a special education teacher of seven years in Arlington, Virginia. He was voted lead teacher of secondary therapeutic program and has a master's in education. He's been in the special, he's been a special education assistant for three years in Rochester, New York, and was a varsity wrestling coach for seven years. And on top of that, the team actually won the district championship in 2018 and 2019. And Dan was voted Coach of the Year for the Liberty District in 2018, which I think is super cool. And a fun fact is his favorite superhero is Batman. So, Dan, you might have to weigh in and tell us if you approve of the new Batman movie or not. Is it a must-see or not so much? Uh, and welcome. It's not <laughs> kid-friendly. Um, it it kind of sticks more to the comic book. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if, you, if you like reading the Batman comics, you'll like the new movie. If, if you prefer the more movie style Batman, you're not gonna be a fan, but I definitely yeah. wouldn't recommend it. And that's it. a good caveat about the kiddos. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a little more um, gruesome than the last few Batmans have been, so. Got it, that's a good, that's a good heads up. So <laughs> I'm sure everyone appreciates that. Um, Dan, thank you for joining us. I know you, you have helped us out before uh, on these calls and it was just so well received received and families felt it so valuable. So we really appreciate you taking time on a Saturday um, to join us again and, and provide additional education for everybody. Oh, my, my pleasure. I'm happy. So let's get to know. Yeah, well, we are so glad you're here. Let's also get to know Molly. 
Molly is 24 years old and has been in the world of special education needs since she was born. She is the younger sister to a brilliant woman who is diagnosed with autism, ADHD, OCD, and a predisposition to epilepsy and articular dyspraxia. In the last three years, she has also been diagnosed with set BP1 haploinsufficiency disorder. As a result of this, she has been gifted to be around some wonderful specialist environments that have inspired her to become a special educational needs teacher, which is amazing. She has a bachelor's degree in special educational needs and inclusion with theology and ethics, a postgraduate diploma in education, and is a qualified teaching, learning, and skills practitioner. As a result of her life experience, she made the choice to work with young people and adults from ages currently 15 to 23, and her job role is the independence lecturer delivering learning specifically tailored and differentiated so that all learners can reach their full potential. And she is joining us from the UK. So is she and her cute pup, I should say. Molly, welcome to the call. I did say I might end up with a chihuahua on my knee. So this is Winnie. <laughs> um, thank Hi, you. Winnie. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, really, she's a, I'm she's really, really excited great, to be great I'm really, husband. really, really excited to be here. It's, it's, a, it's a first for me to do something like this, and I'm, I'm incredibly excited. So, thank you. Well, we are, we are thrilled, and this is just, I think, an important topic for all of our families. And what we love about these calls, and we got this feedback when we did the IEP call for the younger students, is that all the things that were discussed were just something they could take and apply immediately. And I think that's so valuable for, for all of our families. So I, I really look forward to this conversation. I wanted to ask you both just a couple of questions um, and then we'll turn it over. I'll turn it over to you all so that you can share your screens and, and walk through the presentation information that you have. Um, you know, Molly, we heard a little bit about just really your personal experiences or what led you to this field and to becoming an expert. Um, would love to just know a little bit more about that if you don't mind to share. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, me and my sister have got a six year age gap. She's six years older than me. So uh, it, it's sort of been my, my entire life has been based around special educational needs. And I, I, I suppose for some people that could sound quite, da quite daunting. And uh, sometimes it was, but um, mm -hmm. her, her education and her her development has been so sort of inspirational to me and so so beautiful to watch happen and although she would never sort of have the qualifications that I have she is now able to live as independently as she can do she's got a this probably means nothing to anyone in America she's got a gold Duke of Edinburgh award um, our, our mum was told that she would never speak she now never never stops talking I was <laughs> she is an absolute inspiration and uh through being around her and through being around the educational settings that she was in I knew that that, that was sort of the the path that I was going to go down and it it's a, it's a lot of work but it is so mm -hmm. meaningful and so, so it's such a wonderful a wonderful thing to do that's wonderful. And, and then and, you want and how has it impacted your oh sorry, go ahead. Oh sorry, I was gonna say you asked about um what what you would call an IEP, uh individual education plans. Um they are they're an aspect of of how we do things in England, but they're not sort of the the legality of of the way that we do things. They are uh we have we have a process called an EHCP plan, which is an educational health and care plan. Uh, and they are they're not necessary you don't need to have one uh, and if your needs can be met without one you will then have an EHC uh, you will then have an in, uh, individual education plan but if if that's not sufficient to meet your needs and and for you to for you to access the education then you, you would then go on to uh, get an EHCP plan. Gotcha. That's really interesting. And I think that's what's so um, brilliant about having you both on the phone is to be able to give these different perspectives of what you're seeing in the UK and then what we see here, you know, in the US. So, um, no, I think that's 
That's really interesting. And, and, and I think the Duke of Edinburgh Award sounds amazing. And I feel like Americans are absolutely obsessed with anything related to a Duke or a Duchess. Or <laughs> so, Obviously, it's really the Queen, cool. it, is, it is the Queen's Jubilee this weekend. She's been on the throne yes. for 70 years. We've had two days off work. It's amazing. So it's been absolutely lovely. <laughs> It I is, love it. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm sure everyone that's from America that's on this call has been following <laughs> it on social media. I mean, I can tell you everything Kate wore over the past, you know, two days. <laughs> so it's just amazing. Um, it's what we Dan, call a bank holiday. You? Tell us we about how. Holiday. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Um, tell us how you got involved in special education, what drew you to the field, um, and then more specifically, just you know the importance of teaching about IEPs and helping families understand them. Yeah, so honestly, um, I didn't see myself in this field. Uh, my, my original undergrad is actually in business. Um, and I came home and couldn't really find a job I liked. And um, my varsity wrestling coach was like, hey, I want you to come coach. I was like, all right, cool. And then I got in the school district and they needed an assistant um, in one of their more higher needs rooms. And I helped the kid for like weeks to try and figure out how to do like a combination lock. And he like started fist pumping and ran up and down the hall and like wanted to call his mom right away. Cause he was so excited. And just seeing that like pure happiness in like the truest sense, I was like, you know what? I think this is what I need to do. So that's when I went back and got my master's in education. Um, but even after getting that diploma, IEPs are tough. Like I'm still learning more about them. Um, but I was blessed with a really good mentor when I started at the school I'm at now. Um, and she had a lot of experience and she took the time to kind of walk me through it. So uh, I feel like that's kind of how I kind of got a lot of, a lot of my knowledge that I have now. Um, and I, to me, it's awesome to be involved in education in general, right? Just teaching kids. But to me, mm -hmm the feeling that you get when you're able to reach a student that feels like they themselves couldn't be reached or um, you kind of help them get over that hump that they've been trying so hard to do that, you know, selfishly feels really good to see. So, um, and then obviously having the daughter, my daughter have Kuhn to freeze and also have to go through the IP process. Now I feel like I've just kind of been blessed because it makes it that much easier having know it all and kind of just makes me want to learn even more about it just to make sure she gets everything she can. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it and, and definitely why I'm super excited to be able to continue to share. So. Yeah, that's just awesome. And, and Molly, one last question I wanted to ask you along these lines, um, having your own diagnosis, how has that changed the way you think about the process of helping others? Um, mm. This is an interesting question because my sister's now 30, so she's no mm. longer in education. And she has in, never been in what we call in England mainstream school. You may call it state school. I, I'm not sure. She's never been in a setting that isn't specialist because she's always had diagnoses, just not, not this new one. So I think in reality for her, in relation to her education, it probably hasn't changed very much. I think that for us, having this sort of underlying, uh, as a, speaking as a family member here rather than a, a rather than a professional, sure. for us it's it's sort of a heading above the rest of the headings, <laughs> above yeah. the subheadings. Yes, it isn't. Sense. It isn't something that's. It's something lovely to know. And I know that may sound odd to people that it's lovely to know that, but it is lovely to know because any any part of her we're proud of and any part of her we love. But in terms of her education, it, it really didn't have much of an impact. I think if if it had been discovered sooner and it was a, a diagnosis that could have happened sooner, I think really the the impact would have been further knowledge for the professionals. It would have been yeah. that we've got a, we've got as I would call them a learner we've got a learner that's got this thing that we've never heard of let's do yeah. some research and we may have another learner that's got this thing that we've never heard of let's do some research and it, it, yeah. it just would have spread that message a little bit further yeah well and if you you know as a professional if you should encounter 
um, you know, someone that has the same diagnosis. I think that would, you know, be an interesting way to help them. And that's something we see a lot with our families. Like, I, I can appreciate that because we got a diagnosis later, you know, so we were already dealing with a lot of the, the learning disabilities before we knew what Hudson had. Thankfully, a lot of our families are getting access to um, genetic uh, testing, I think, a lot sooner, right? And so they are getting these answers in a way that maybe some of us mm -hmm. or our family members didn't have access to um, before. Uh, what about, so we're going to switch gears just a little bit before I, I give the, the ball to you all. One question we always ask our speakers is, just so we can get to know you a little bit better, can you tell us a couple of fun facts? Now, we know Dan loves Batman, um, but can you tell us a couple of fun facts about yourself that are unrelated to, like, science or education? Oh, I mean, one of my favourites that is kind of related to education is that I could uh, I could use Makaton signing to spell the alphabet before I could say the alphabet <laughs> as a child. Oh. My mum used to put the put the shapes in my hands, and I was able to do that before I could speak it. Um, I can't drive. I'm 24 and I can't drive. That's probably very unusual in America. <laughs> that might be a fun <laughs> fact. <laughs> That is um, a fun fact. <laughs> uh, got plenty of these little creatures hanging about. Um, oh, so cute. So I yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm that interesting. It's quite, it's quite <laughs> difficult to answer. Um, <laughs> what about you, Dan? Um, Outside Batman and wrestling, we know are important to you. Any other fun facts? Um. So. Obviously, with the last name like Morielli, I'm very, very Sicilian. Um, so I learned my great grandmother's sauce recipe, um, and so Avery and I, at least once, if not twice a month, we make we make some family sauce and and do some like homemade baked ziti. So um, I love cooking my family yeah. recipes <laughs> with my daughter. Uh, and then I guess the other thing is that we're we're just a very active family. Um, so we like being outside and just kind of take every chance to be together that we can. So I I don't know, you know, maybe that's more biographical than fun fact but um i think i might have to steal one from you dad from you daniel <laughs> my family is german so uh, we make like schnitzel and things like that and uh, my, si my sister likes to cook cook with us whenever whenever she gets the chance as well so there you go <laughs> Yeah, noted. Well, and my, uh, and Dan, I'm sorry, my, my uh, Southern Tennessee accent apparently came out there for a second when I completely mispronounced your last name and said Morial <laughs> instead of Morialli. So sorry about that. You well, managed to get mine good. right though, which never happens. So. <laughs> okay. Well, that we'll call that at least, you know, one for two, I guess. Um, so I want to give you guys a chance. I know you have a lot of important information to share. Um, and want to give you all an opportunity to do that. And then once you've had a chance to share some of the information you brought for today's call, then we'll dive into some of the family questions. So I'll just turn it over to you all for now and whoever wants to kind of jump in first and then we'll answer questions at the end. I don't mind, Molly, if you want to go first. and then uh, Well, I think oh, uh, I'm sure people will probably have guessed that we've spoken previously and we sort of uh, made a little <laughs> bit of a plan of what we wanted to speak about. And uh, I think if I, am I, I'm not used to doing this uh, Zoom thing. We use Teams here, so uh, share, share screen. <laughs> um, stop. Oh, I'm I'm trying to share. <laughs> I say I will say while well, Molly's loading up her screen, um, like she mentioned, we did get a chance to talk. And for the American families, I will say it was surprising in our conversation that we obviously have different terms and things like that, but there is quite a bit of overlap. Um, that that Molly and I talked about that was kind of surprising, but there's definitely some right. things that are I am sharing the screen. Today, it but. says so. I created a little bit of a presentation. Can you see what I'm showing? Yep. We sure can. Yep. Looks great. Right. So uh, the first thing that me and uh, Daniel sort of discussed talking about was transitions, and that can be whether your child, your young adult, your your adult is a uh, is transitioning from an educational setting into a into a a different educational setting or it could be from education into work and I thought the the first thing that I would present would be kind of a list of, of important questions to ask so when your child or young adult is transitioning from an educational placement to an edu a different educational placement or into work there are really 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 important questions to ask and they're questions that are important not only as a relative but also as 
a practitioner because these are the questions that I need to be able to answer. So the first thing is, can that setting meet their needs? Can that workplace meet their needs? Can that new house that they're going to move into meet their needs? That, that can be anything from, are there enough people there to, is there a lift? Anything like that. And Daniel, please feel free to, to interrupt at any point and, and add your two cents into these things. Um, for us here in England, we have to consider, does this person have a care plan? What are their medical needs? Do they have a, 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 a lifelong condition? I, I work with someone who has uh, had a plastic left heart syndrome. That is a medical need that I need to be aware of. And as a, as a setting that we need to be aware of, we need to say, this person may come with a risk assessment from their previous setting, but we, do we need an additional one? Does this person have moving and handling, which for us in England means, are they in a wheelchair? Do they need hoisting? Do they need support with their with walking upstairs uh, any anything about that or do they need help with their personal care do they need help to go to the toilet do we need to add an additional additional risk assessment stating that this person wants only female or only male staff and um, do any outside agencies need to involve be involved for us in England that could be as extreme as the police it could be care services it could be health services it could be it could be uh, the prevent team which are which are people who uh, stop sort of radi radicalization gang violence things like that funding it's a massive thing it, is this place sort of staffed enough to facilitate this person and what they require does this person need one-to-one -one support if this this individual needs one-to-one -one support are we able to put the appropriate funding in place and the impact on the quality of their education, if, if we are not able to facilitate all of these things that I've, I've already spoken about, what is the impact going to be on their education? What is the impact going to be on their, their acquisition, them acquiring the knowledge they need for their next steps? And it's, it's okay for any family member, any care support, anyone to say, what changes are you going to make? We have gone through all of these things. This person does have a care plan. This setting could meet their needs. We've got an additional risk assessment. We've got all of these things, but what as a company are you going to do to facilitate these person's needs? And I think these are incredibly important questions to ask. And they're important not only, as I say, for the, the family member, the individual that's that supporting this person but they're also important for the person because all of these things ensure quality education quality care and quality understand quality understanding so that's sort of my my oh sorry <laughs> my first i don't know how to stop sharing <laughs> oh no so actually molly i think um why don't we just have you kind of go through i know that we we discussed maybe kind of going back and forth but um, I think with the screen share and stuff, we'll just have you kind of do your presentation and then I can kind of comment and build off of what, mm -hmm. you, what you share. Okay, we'll do it that way then. <laughs> yeah, I know that's I'll not start what sharing. we discussed, but I think I'll logistically, start. it just might make more sense, so. Okay, that's, that's completely fine. <laughs> I am just gonna, goodness, this is ever so complicated doing this. <laughs> oh, screen. Can you uh, see this again? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Goodness me. Screen. Stop. Uh, but I'll right. say while, while you're loading that up, I will, um, so that way you can focus on that. I will definitely say, so that, that transitioning into that second place is definitely gives a lot of our parents um, some concerns. So. I think those were phenomenal questions to consider. And I think that they're important questions that everyone asks. Yeah. Because it's it really is about the quality of care and the quality of the education. And it's okay, it really is okay to say this place can't meet meet my child, my family members, my young adults' needs. So let's find somewhere else. And that doesn't have to be at the start of a transition. You can transition in and think everything is absolutely happy and lovely and whatever it can come to the point where you you are able to say this this place doesn't meet the needs anymore 
and it's a, it's okay to move from there. Right. Uh, another thing that me and Daniel spoke about is the importance of the individual and um, it's really really important I put learners in there because that's what that's what we call our students it's really really important that we see them as young adults or as I, a lot of mine are adults uh, a lot of the people that I teach are adults and it's really really important that as adults we value their opinions and the importance of their voice um, by having these individuals be a part of discussions that relate to their current setting or their future we're allowing them to take ownership over their choices their wishes their desires that can be their current choices or it can be their future 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 choices that can be what's your 10-year plan it, it can it can really be that and uh, these can include documents such as all about me documents which i uh, i tend to do at the start of every academic year here in the uk I, I want I, I've been given a sheet that tells me all about you but I want to know what you think about you I want to know what you enjoy what you want what what you would like to learn and things like that I always do it at the, at the at the start and the very end of every term I do sort of exactly the same worksheet but it, just in different words different wording that the first one outlines what we're going to be covering and what what do you want to learn what are the new things that you want to want to develop and the the one at the end of the term is what have you developed and how did you do it and they always go why is there two of them here and I say because you're so brilliant that you've learned more than one thing um so it, it's about these achievements and what 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 the individual wants um and this brings me on to a big point that me and Daniel spoke about and it was one of the things that we were quite shocked how how similar things were um it's what here in the uk we call reasonable adjustments which is written in the special educational needs code code of practice which goes from the age of zero to 25 it's sort of the special needs bible so to say and uh, there are things within the code of practice that are named as should and there are things that are named as must and the things that are named as must are actually legal requirements so it is the law that you do those things a reasonable adjustment is a must. It is a law. It can be defined as I've written as aims to present the uh, disabled student from suffering substantial disadvantage as a result of their disability and hence allow them to reach their maximum potential. And I think this is so, so important and I cannot, cannot stress this enough, how able it is and how important it is that people know that this re the fact that reasonable adjustments are the law <laughs> they're a legal requirement um that can be in relation to the importance of the of the individual i, I work with uh, quite a few learners actually that are uh, they're selective mutes so it's not that they cannot communicate verbally but they don't want to and that's completely their choice a reasonable adjustment for me would be to offer them a whiteboard to write write what they want to say down or to offer them we use signs and symbols we use a lot of makaton in in england i'm not in, i'm not sure if you use makaton in america um and it, it, it would be having those signs and symbols where you can build a sentence without having to say these things so it's about having these individuals in meetings and in important decisions about their futures i know when we have ehcp reviews educational health, health and care plan reviews in the setting that I'm currently in the individuals are always asked for their opinion they are always invited into the meetings they may not want to join the meetings but being invited in and if they and if they don't want to there will always be someone there to sort of get get their views and get their opinions as as is so I think it can be very very scary I think for for family members as a family member myself to think oh my goodness they're not they're not going to know what we're talking about and they're not going to they're not going to understand and it's going to be very overwhelming and it's going to be too much stress but the, the this is the the stress of these reasonable adjustments it is the the it, can we have this meeting in a room that's got sofas so my family member my my son my daughter my niece my nephew can lay down and just listen it really is just those those little things that are going to make people be able to communicate and going to make people able to to facilitate their own futures and, and and take ownership over their own choices 
so I think I'm going to stop sh stop sharing there because I think you've got probably quite similar um, slides to share, Daniel, for the transitions and the um, the the voice of the individual. And then, as we spoke about, we've got sort of slightly different directions to go on, and I think I'd be rambling for hours. So. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll share my screen now. Hopefully, I can do it smoothly. We'll see. It says Chrome unknown. Hopefully, that's the one I need. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, system preferences. Uh oh, I may not have unlocked my features. It should just say share content and then you can select which one you want to share. Yeah, it told me that I've not given it. Um, hold on, give me one second here. So apparently I have not given it permissions and it's not letting me share my slide. Um, so I guess I'll just, I can just talk about them. Sorry, you guys, I, I know I sent them, I think I shared them with Casey earlier. Um, you did, I'm actually gonna see if, while you talk, I'm gonna see if I can pull them up, okay? Okay, that works. Um, so basically I was gonna do a quick overview of like the last things that we talked about in my last presentation, just kind of refresh everyone's memory um, and then key terms and then kind of go from there. Um, but so basically in the last meeting, I talked a lot about how an IEP is formed, what are the components of the IEP. Um, we discussed kind of what, a you know, the present level of performance page. We talked a little bit about um, reevaluations, which happen every three years. Um, so if you could go to slide the third one. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we talked about reevaluation, which is when you get um, testing every three years or they meet to discuss if they need testing to continue eligibility. Um, we talked about what least restrictive environment means and service hours. Um, and again, when you think of least restrictive environment, the caveat of that is not just the least restrictive environment, but the least restrictive environment where your child can learn. Um, sometimes that means that they're in the public school and the big classroom with two teachers. Sometimes that means they're in a small class with four or five other kids and a couple of adults. Uh, we talked about goals, how they should be set and things like that. Um, and then as Molly was talking about with the reasonable adjustments, that is what we call accommodations here. Um, so when I get to that point, we'll, we'll kind of dive into it. And as you can see, I put that in all caps locks because as kids get older, in my personal opinion, the service hours and the environment are obviously important, but the accommodations and your child knowing them um, is significantly more important. So um, next one, please. I'm sorry, I couldn't share my screen, so. All right, so transitioning out here um, in regards to elementary school to middle school, this, this can change county to county. Um, so first things first is knowing what grade. I know that there are some systems that go K3, four, five, six, and then 712 or 78 and 9 through 12. I know that there are some that go K through 6. And then again, 712 or 78, 9 through 12. Um, some do K through 5, and then grades 4, 5, and 6 in the middle school, and 9 through 12, or yeah, 7 through 12. So I know it can kind of be all kinds of combinations. So it's important as a parent that you know when that transition is occurring. Um, and then some things to consider. Will your student be changing classes independently or will they do it as a class? So like typically if it's a fourth or fifth grade class, they probably will still walk, they'll change for their classes, but more than likely it'll be a teacher that walks them. If your middle school is six, seven, eight, more than likely starting in sixth grade, they're going to have to learn to navigate the building. Um, so if, you're, if your child is someone that may struggle with that, then that's something you need to talk about at the IEP meeting and get an accommodation um, where they might be able to have somebody walk them class to class, or maybe they get dismissed from class three minutes early so they can get a head start and not be in the crowded halls. Um, but it is something definitely you would have to start to consider. Again, class sizes and what setting you're offered. So my school is massive. We have like 2,800 kids. So our average class size, if you're in the integrated setting is approximately 28 to 32. Um, so 
can your child learn in that type of setting? But I know, you know, Casey's saying she just moved out, you know, a little bit farther away. So her school may not be that big. So th those class sizes may not be as much of a concern. Um, so kind of understanding where your child is going. Um, and then as far as when I say what settings are offered, I'll get, I'll touch back on that a little bit more when we get towards diploma track stuff um, after transitioning. But sometimes there are settings that you have to be in in order to follow that diploma track. And then other times there are ways to stay on the diploma track um, and be in smaller settings. So it's kind of understanding what that looks like. Um, and then again, do any of your classes count towards a diploma? So an example of this is sometimes our seventh graders will take advanced courses and they might be in algebra and that counts towards high school. Um, and I know out here, every eighth grader takes a world geography class and that one class counts um, towards earning your degree. So um, starting to pay attention to some of that, even as early as seventh and eighth grade. Um, okay, next one. This one is middle school to high school. Um, there are a lot of things to think about. Um, first and foremost, and this is where uh, Emily and I are firmly in agreement on, is having your child with you during the IEP meeting. Um, I recommend doing this as early as seventh grade. Um, they probably won't be an active participant at that age because it'll be their first meeting. They're still kind of getting comfortable with it. Uh, but for sure, no later than ninth grade. Do you want, like your child needs to be there by ninth grade, even if you think it's going to make them uncomfortable even if you don't want them necessarily hearing the weakness side, because obviously we have to talk about strengths and weaknesses in order to build an IEP. Um, so working with your student's case carrier as well as at home and kind of prepping them for that is huge because once you hit ninth grade, hormones are in full gear and you kind of want to start being your own person. And at that point, if you know your accommodations and you understand them, you can say, oh, I don't need that one anymore. I can get to class by myself. Um, you know, I might not need to sit in the front row anymore. I can sit in the back because I have these glasses. I can see, I understand it. I'm being given the notes instead of taking the notes. Um, or, or maybe that they're not, right? And they're sitting there and they're saying, well, the reason I don't understand it is because I'm so focused on writing what's on the board. I'm not really listening. So then we can add in the accommodation of you get the notes supplied, right? So having your child there to advocate for themselves is just as important as having you there to advocate on their behalf. And the other part of that is once you hit ninth grade, as much as if we wanted you to graduate the high school diploma, that's really when you also start looking past that four year high school, right? So by the time they're in 11th and 12th grade, they really need to have an understanding of their IEP. Um, especially if they, when they turn 18, they sign the IEP themselves. It's, it's on them at that point. Parents are invited, parents come to the meeting, but the, the child actually signs. So if that's the first meeting they've ever been to, they don't really understand what they're signing. So um, again, I, I, I can't emphasize enough having, having your child there and advocating for themselves. Um, and again, kind of like Molly was saying, even if you talk with them before the meeting and you're gonna end up being their voice, the fact that they can be there and listening and even like whisper to you or maybe you know give you a note or something that says, hey, I actually want this, even if they're not comfortable sharing themselves, having them there is very important. Um, again, understanding class setting that exists for your child. Would um, I just be able to add one thing in yeah. terms of uh, in England's perspective there? Yeah. Um, in terms of advocating, obviously the, the ideal is that uh, the individual is able to advocate for themselves. If not, there's a, a, a parent or carer that is able to do that. Um, Obviously, it's, it's in no way talking for the individual. We want that individual to be expressing their wants, their desires, their choices for their future and, and what they're doing. But there's also uh, access to independent advocates here in the UK uh, that are people that are completely external. They're nothing to do with the school. They're nothing to do with the family. But they're an independent advocate that can... The, they are trained to get to know your child or your your niece your nephew the person that you're caring for uh they're trained to get to know this person and they're trained to to express their views the way that they say them it's no sort of i don't want to go to maths 
Matthew expressed that he did not like maths because, no, it's exactly how it's said. That is the point of their job. And there is an access to ind independent advocacy services across the UK, as, as far as I'm aware. I know that in every county that I've ever lived in, in every school that I've ever been in, if that's necessary, there is always the access to, a, to an independent advocate. Thank you. That's good to know. Uh, I say that that means something. Our our advocates are almost more like lawyers here. Um, so when you, when you bring an advocate in, typically the school district knows you mean business. So, um, so one of the other things we kind of talked about. So here we so in Arlington we call it our career center. Um, in New York we called it VOCES. I don't know what that stands for at this point. So I'm pretty sure these exist everywhere and basically it's a tech school it might be where you learn automotive trades construction cosmetology barbering i mean we our, our program is absurd because again we live in a big city so we have a lot of different programs but finding out um if if so like sometimes it's done as a county sometimes it's done with individual school districts but they're almost always available so if you have a conversation with your kid in ninth grade and your child's expressing hey you know what i might want to fix cars I might want to get into plumbing. I might want to get into electricity. You know, you can send them to these classes while in high school. Um, and some of the high school programs are just kind of intro to see if you like it, they're hands on. Uh, and then I, I, at my school, so like if you get into um, auto tech in 10th grade, you graduate, if you pass the test, you graduate as a certified mechanic. Um, so exploring that part of it, because typically, so like for us, you're at the school, um, doing a normal day. And then at some point in your day, you catch a bus, you go to the career center or the tech center, whatever it's called in, in your local area. And then you come back and finish school or you finish school there and you bus home. Um, and ours offers some special education services. So I would say, look into that, consider that, think about that, just kind of finding out. It's amazing the amount of programs that your school probably has that you don't even know because you never thought to ask. So diving into that kind of stuff. Um, and so my very last point here on this slide is considering and not overlooking the social impact of your child's setting. What I mean by that is, so I'll use my school as an example. So we have essentially three or four settings that you can be in. We have a life skills setting. Um, those students will earn what we call an applied studies diploma, which basically means, yes, you went to high school. Yes, you finished it, but you didn't take any of the state exams. Um, cause those students are much more focused on navigating the community, going right into the workforce, things like that. Uh, then we have what's called the self-contained setting, uh, which means that every student in that room has an IEP and typically they max out about 12 kids and there's two to three adults in every class. But even within that, we have two separate settings of that. One setting is for the students who need that environment but are capable of passing the state tests. So sometimes you can be in self-contained classes and still be 100% on path to get a standard diploma and graduate with that. Um, and then we also have that setting for students that might not be academically capable to pass those state tests. Um, and I could probably, I, I could probably ramble on about diplomas at this point. I might as well just be a guidance counselor. So um, there are lots of different styles of diplomas, at least here in Virginia. There are, there are ways that are specific for students with IEPs to earn a diploma at a little bit of a lower standard. But when you apply to college or jobs, they never know that that's a thing. Um, so it's important to weigh that against the social aspect, because sometimes children with special needs, they get so secluded, they get put in such a restrictive environment, they don't actually get to be social. So now they end up in a setting or they're in a work environment where they have to interact with people and they're uncomfortable. Um, Cause I certainly understand the fear of, and you know, my daughter's six years old and she weighs 30 pounds and she's, you know, the smallest kid by a mile in her class. So I certainly understand the nerves and the anxiety mm -hmm. of having them be in those bigger environments and things like that. But at the same time, they'll never learn those social skills. They'll never build lifelong friendships um, if they don't at least have that opportunity. So you know your child best. And hopefully your case carrier is an open line of communication with you. And the two of you working together can figure out the ideal fit. Um, but I, like that. I said, 
I feel like sometimes the social stuff can get overlooked. So don't, don't, don't um, overlook that with just having in mind, I want my kid to get that diploma. Also think about them as like a whole child. I, I completely agree with you, Daniel, about, about thinking of them as a whole child and the fact that it's really, really important for people to have, a, have social interactions and, and to create bonds as, as much as they are able to do that, because that can be a real challenge for, to, for people who've got certain types of autism and things like that. Uh, what I would just add to that is if your child or your family member is work is educationally working at a, a much much lower age range than than their actual age i can use my sister as an example i'm absolutely okay to say this her educational ability is a primary school level which for us is four to eleven she's probably sort of somewhere in the middle maybe lower to that but if you were to put her with a group of 30 year olds because she's 30 she, that's not a social interaction that's not a that's not her having a peer group so in my opinion sometimes it's necessary to put not to put I don't I don't think that's the right word but but to choose to to have individuals that have got additional needs with other people that other individuals that have got additional needs that are at, that are at a similar sort of level of understanding than they are because they are, that creates a peer group and that may not be the peer group that they're supposed to be determined on their age, I don't, supposed to be, sounds sounds ridiculous to me, but on their age, but it means that they have a social group of people that they can relate to and that understand them and that they understand. I think that's really, really important to consider as well, because I, I have worked with several individuals that have been placed in settings because they they need to make friends that's they're your friends they're your same age but they're but they're not and that can open open up a, a can of worms and I'm sure I'm sure you can relate to this Daniel of safeguarding issues because these people can then become quite vulnerable if they're not surrounded by people that are that are their peers that are at the same level of understanding that enjoy this similar things that it can open up an absolute can of worms so I do, I just would like to throw that one in there a little bit <laughs> yeah no I, I i completely agree um yeah definitely like i said when i when i mentioned that I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of just not 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 over like i said i guess that, that's what i keep using but just like taking that in consideration um especially oh, got, it's so important for people to have peers it's just important that those peers are are actually peers rather than people that are miles above them or in, in terms of their social abilities, their intellectual abilities, it, that, that's not a peer group. It just is not a peer group. <laughs> right. Um, so then the other thing that I want to mention about our transition um, age-wise is typically starting in 11th grade, you can start a little earlier if you're really feeling motivated. Um, touch base with, we call them a transition coordinator. Uh, I don't know what they would be called elsewhere, but it's basically a person specifically under the umbrella of special education department, and they are in charge of post-secondary guidance, meaning what can children with an IEP do going forward? Um, and obviously that's different for everyone, um, but their job is to find, maybe there are local colleges that have special education programs built into them. Uh, maybe there are um, like, so we have, we have what's called a PEP program, which basically is life skill training. Um, and the students that succeed in that, they're technically still enrolled in high school, um, but they get internships, they learn practical skills, they take field trips, riding buses, so they can learn how to navigate the community. Um, they can help you. And I gave some examples down here. Uh, so Job Corps, for like our parents with older children, um, Job Corps is essentially college real life job training. So you apply to Job Corps, it's a, U, it's a federal program, you live at a dorm, and then you go to an internship to learn that job, you get paid while you're there. If you haven't earned your high school diploma, they help you do that. Um, I think it's a great program. It's that's different than we also I just learned this this year that we have like a lot of times local unions will do apprenticeships that you can apply for and be accepted in, in the fall, just like you would 
um, going into a college. So again, for some of our, our kind of higher workers or, or maybe college isn't for them, but they can go right into the workforce and learn a trade. Um, and the beauty of an apprenticeship is when it's done, you walk right into that job, right? So not only do you get the training, but you're also given a job and, and unions got a lot of pull. So if you can get into a union, that's, you know, that's a great setup. Um, again, as I mentioned, there are special programs in colleges. You have to find them. They're, they're there, but they're tough to find. Um, and then the last one that this, that I think is also important is how to get accommodations in college. So let's say you've decided that your child can handle like a community school type setting where they can still be home. You can kind of be involved. Um, and even four year programs offer these as well, where you submit your IEP to a very specific department and they may or may not accept the, cal the, the accommodations. They won't provide service hours. You probably won't have a case carrier, but you can get access to some of those accommodations that you've had your whole career. Um, and the person, like I said, we call them the transition coordinator. So the person who's in charge of getting your child set up for the post-secondary setting, um, they can help you navigate exactly what that document needs to look like, when it needs to be updated, things like that. Um, so that you have the best chance of getting those accommodations in college. Uh, and then as I'm talking and I'm thinking about this, there's also federal programs. Um, again, I don't know what all the acronyms stand for. There's DARS program. So there's all kinds of government programs that our children can access to help them in that next step. And this person is your go-to person for that. So you want to start requesting at minimum a consultation with your student and the transition coordinator before your yearly meeting. Um, and if not, have them actually in the meeting if they, if they are available. Obviously, typically schools have, I mean, my school is 2,900 kids, uh, 300 IEP students, and we only have two of these uh, positions. So they may be a very, very busy person. Um, but by telling your case carrier, you want them to be in contact with them. You, you can start building that relationship and make contact with them outside of the IEP meeting. Um, but this is those with older children that are about to graduate this is the person you want to find out who they are and start picking their brain. Um, so I think, I think that might be as far as my transition stuff goes. Um, Cause I think really, I don't, and I don't know if I put up slides. I think the other thing I was going to talk about was diploma track. Which, yeah, I think that was it. Yeah. Um, our diploma track stuff is very different than, than the UK. So I think that's where Molly and I kind of start to, to split, but <laughs> I will, yeah, I will, but you to know, be honest I, with you, I, I wasn't going to go too much into sort of tracking and things like that in terms of uh, what we do in England because uh, it it can be very sort of individualized depending on what sort of setting you're in. Um, we obviously within state education, which does does include special specialist set in special schools as well. Um, there are exams that are taken and and things like that, but it's very very individualized and I think even from hearing you speak just now the the focus seems to be a lot on getting these diplomas and getting this and getting the other whereas I, I, I just with the with the right support and with EHCP plans in 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 place and whatever there isn't really that amount of pressure on on learners in the UK to to achieve a, di a, a diploma I mean we don't we don't have that here anyway but I, I know that I work with learners that have left their secondary education which we I think you would call high school they leave there at 16 that haven't got any any qualifications at all and that's okay <laughs> that is okay for us that is absolutely fine they come to us and and they may be put on a qualification with us they may not be put on a qualification with us it all depends on their level it's 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 very very individualized uh, in terms of in terms of what we do so okay yeah i say so here one of the big one of the big things about that is um so regardless so even the applied studies diploma that i was talking about um for students who don't necessarily take the state exams by earning that and that's typically based on your iep like have you reached your iep goals and that's that's essentially how you earn that diploma um here in the u.s by filling out any application whether it's mcdonald's or anywhere by checking that I have a high school diploma, they're required to pay you more. Um, so it, 
over time, it makes a, it makes a big difference. So that's why there's a lot of emphasis on getting that checked. So, and I mean, that's the case for us as well. If you, if you can tick that you've got GCSEs or A-levels or a degree or, or, or any of those things, there is the chance that you are more likely to be employed, but, um, it, it sort of isn't the be all and end all and, and we're, we're we're very realistic at, at least in the setting that I'm in we're very realistic that uh it it may not be possible for this person to get a, a GCSE in English but it is possible for them to learn life skills and to be able to live individually and to be able to to go on work experience which we offer and and get a get a, a part-time job in a in in whatever whatever suits them best it's 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 not that we don't w- want them to achieve. Of course we do. If someone is able to, is able to get a GCSE or, or a qualification in something, of course we want them to do that. However, sometimes we have to tailor the, the education more towards the life skills that you're gonna that you're gonna you're gonna get and the and the ability to to care for not only yourself but for others and and to understand the world that you live in. Right. Yeah, I mean, one can one one can argue that's important for all of our students. At least, one of my my qualms here in the U.S. is sometimes I think we overlook those basic skills of balancing a checkbook. What does rent mean? Budgeting. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, my uh, first term this year was all about being an active part of the community. That was it. Was about how do you vote? How do you pay your bills? How do you pay tax? What happens with tax? It, it was all of those things. And and to be honest with you, I thought my learners were going to find it really, really boring. <laughs> I thought they were going to be like, oh my goodness, Molly, when are we going out? When are we cooking? I've had enough of this. But they absolutely loved it. They absolutely loved it. And it was it was really, really important as I was doing it to see their their enjoyment of it and their and their and and seeing their their them gaining the knowledge of how do I vote how do I pay bills <laughs> how do I because the these are things that are, are really really important so yeah um I know I, I see that so I will I we did have kind of one parent interest in diploma stuff so I will say I can explain it thoroughly through Virginia I think we are parallel to common core um, Virginia is one of two states that decided not to adopt Common Core, so what I say might be a touch different. Um, but I'm going to assume that they're all going to be fairly similar. Um, so, like I said, first thing that you want to like keep pay attention to is um, at what age can you start earning high school credits? Uh, typically, in seventh grade, those are like advanced students um, that are earning the math credits and stuff like that. But by eighth grade, everyone should be. Um, you, like I said, for us, it's a history class. Sometimes they start language in, in eighth grade, things like that. Um, so here in Virginia, we have four different types of diplomas. Advanced, advanced, yeah, four different types of diplomas. Diplomas. The first one is an advanced diploma, and they just changed the standards. It literally is the exact same thing as the standard, except you have a language component, meaning you've taken a foreign language. Uh, either for three years or two languages for two years each. Um, And out here, American Sign Language counts. Um, And I say that because I know a lot of our children that can't struggle to speak. I know my daughter, she was making some signs before she could speak. Um, It's obviously very basic, but it might be a natural um, language for them to take with some understanding that would actually be possible for them and, and not necessarily struggle. Um, as mightily as if they had to learn French or Spanish or Italian or Japanese or something. Um, so that, so definitely knowing that, like when you go, when you go or entering high school, um, I also forgot to mention this. So when you're in that eighth grade and you're about to hit ninth grade, I would request to have someone from the high school special education department at that meeting because they can speak, you can ask specifically, what does their school offer? What do the diplomas look like? What does it matter in ninth grade? If we enter these classes, are we automatically behind? Um, and the eighth grade teacher might not be able to answer those questions because admittedly, they don't, they don't have to look down that road. Um, so make sure you request to have someone from the high school there representing them, uh, the high school. So a standard diploma means that you've had four credits 
of history, um, four credits of math, four credits of English, and four credits of science. How states accept that will be very different, um, but I can tell you, so we, we try to bend over backwards in our school to make sure that our students that have special needs can earn that. So we have, so like our algebra class, our ninth graders, if they had to sit for that test after one year, that's probably not gonna be a success. So we have broken algebra down into algebra one, part one and algebra one, part two. So you get one year of algebra, but it's spread out over two years. And then you sit for the state exam after that. Now, if you use that, you get what's called a standard with accommodations. What that means is you've accessed certain things that children without an IEP can access. However, the only people who know that are your school district and the Department of Education. So no, like when you get, when they get a diploma, it looks just like another diploma. If you're going to college, you mark, I got a standard diploma. No one ever knows your state scores. Um, Cause if you get it, if you do a standard with accommodations um, you can score lower and still pass than someone without an IEP. It's basically the state's way of acknowledging that these children have had special needs. They have different struggles than everyone else. They might get some things in class that they're not allowed to get on this two hour exam. So they kind of give you some wiggle room. Um, so those are really the three main, right? Advanced standard and standard with accommodations, which basically means you did everything you had to do to earn your standard diploma. You just needed some help because you have an IEP. Um, and then we have what's called an applied studies diploma, which basically means that you came to four years of schooling or more. You tried to earn your standard diploma, but you couldn't pass tests or maybe those classes that gave you um, like state credit were a little bit too difficult. So when they go to graduate and you check that they're going for an applied studies diploma, all that means is as a case carrier, I have to justify that they made significant progress towards meeting their goals or that they did in fact master their goals. Um, the beauty of an applied studies diploma, at least again here in Virginia, is you can get accepted into community schools with it, um, with the caveat you don't get federal funding, um, but you can go into all of their remediation classes if that's something you were interested in. But also, and for me more importantly, it allows you to check, I have a high school diploma on those applications when you go into the workforce. Um, but you can also still come back and take night classes or whatever until you're 21 and try to earn that standard diploma. So it kind of gives you like, yes, I can go right in the workforce, I have my diploma, and if I'm happy doing that, I can, but if I really want that standard diploma, I can go back until I earn it until I'm 21. Um, so, Again, that's specifically to Virginia as far as like what I 100% know is certain. Um, federally speaking, Common Core has some different caveats. I know that, um, but it should all be pretty similar because I know um, the big reason Virginia didn't adopt it is because of the extra funding and testing that's mandated through it. And they didn't want to pay all that money to do all that as a state. Um, but I think they tried to say like, yeah, we don't do Common Core, but we're pretty, pretty close aligned with it. Um, so hopefully that at least gives you questions minimally to ask your case carriers um, for guidance on. But it, I, I can speak for our state. It seems like we are acknowledging at a higher rate that there are a lot of children that have a lot of struggles and to force everyone to do a cookie cutter path to a diploma isn't necessarily the way anymore. So I think that there are a lot of ways to get a diploma without it being quote unquote, the typical track. Um, so I think, I think it's important to, again, keep that as I, and I talked about in the last part, that open dialogue with your case carrier and any question you have, call and ask, even if you think you're annoying them, because this year you might have, because this year the teacher burnout was real. But other than this year, I think normally people are like, enthused when parents are reaching out because they want mm -hmm. you involved so Dan that's really I, that's really helpful I mean I like I, a mom of a kid that's about to be a fifth grader I mean these these are hard 
hard conversations, you know, big decisions to make. And so, I mean, just understanding it, you explain it in a way that I can, I can appreciate and understand. So I, I appreciate that. I and mean, that was really, really helpful around the diplomas. I mean, even just for me personally, um, I, I want to take a minute and we're at, at time for today, but just to thank you both. I mean, we had a handful of questions, but I was reading them as you guys were going and you answered all of them. I mean, it's, your presentations were so helpful and Molly having your perspective as well. Um, I think just is going to be really meaningful for the people who are watching. And so again, just really want to thank you both for taking time out of your day on a Saturday to come and chat with us. Literally just can I really quickly just mention one thing, just in case there is anyone from the UK yes. that's watching. Um, uh, there's a thing that is called, it's currently called a dolls. It's not going to be called that in the future. There's There's been massive changes to it, but um for the current moment, it's called a dolls. My sister has a dolls in place. And uh, the reality is sometimes we work with, with learners that have got additional needs that are unable to make choices to protect themselves. And that, that in the UK is what we call a best interest decision. And I just wanted to mention it as something, as, as kind of part of that transition process. If the, the new thing that's coming in, the... Um, uh, safeguarding process that was previously called dolls uh is going from 16 upwards it's something that you have to go for to get but the reality of it is that if if your child your family member is unable to make best interest decisions for themselves this is a this is a legal document where you are given a representative person if you do not have a representative person one will be paid for for you um and uh that person's called the uh, uh and this in a way is saying this individual is unable to make best interest decisions for themselves therefore we are able to do that to ensure their safety and to ensure that they are that they are safe and that they are they are doing everything that, that, that needs to be done to ensure this person is safe. And I think it's so important that, that, that people are aware of this process because unfortunately, and like I said, my sister has got a dolls in place. It's not something that anyone expects or wants or, or anything like that. However, it is a way to legally protect not only yourself, but to protect these people and to, to, to protect these individuals. And, um, it is uh, the, the new process that's, that's coming in. The, the old one was deemed um, overly technical and too legalised and things like that. But uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, enshrines the person's right to liberty unless, uh, unless certain requirements aren't met. And sometimes that isn't the case. So if you are in the situation and you are in England and you are watching that you want your, your family member to go into a supported living or you're aware that they're going to spend some time in a hospital or things like that it's really so important that things like this are put in place to ensure that the best choices that can be made are made and if that means that you have to make them on behalf of that individual that's that's exactly what a dolls is for so sorry i just had to throw that in there no, i think that's, that I think that's so Molly, important. thank you yeah, no, I'm so I'm so glad you thought to mention that. And and again, I mean, just the information you all have shared is just so valuable. And I really hope I hope we can talk you into coming and doing it again, <laughs> because families always get so much out of it. So um, again, just before we hang up, want to thank Dan and Molly. Um, also, want to thank those of you who are watching, and um, that just the the way that we can share this kind of information and get it out quickly that you all can immediately use. I mean, these are the kinds of things we want to continue to do through this uh, partnership of It Takes a Village. So stay tuned for more calls um, that will, will be scheduled over the summer and going into the fall. And again, I hope you all have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend, and we'll look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good Thank one. Thank you.